Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for joining us today. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over just a few uh, housekeeping items. You'll find your control panel at the bottom of your screen where you can manage your audio display and closed captioning settings. Everyone's microphone has been muted for the presentation today, but we will have time for questions at the end. You can submit your questions by clicking the Q&A box uh, in your control panel. You'll see a pop-up window where you can type in your question and we'll share those later on. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Holbrook Travel is pleased to bring you this webinar today, Experience Forest Bathing, the Healing Power of Nature with special guest, Sylvie Rocab. This webinar is designed to help you shift your experience of this pandemic from isolation to connection and awaken the healing power of the ancient practice of forest bathing, also known as nature therapy, in your daily life. During this webinar, Sylvie will share with us the concept of forest bathing, what it is, how it got started, and its potential for mainstream practice today. She'll also walk us through an interactive invitation or exercise to better understand what it's all about. If you're joining us on a mobile device and have a good internet connection, and if you're able to be outdoors, we encourage you to do that. If you're indoors, that's okay too. We just recommend being near items that are closest to their natural forms, whether it's a rock or a potted plant, herbs or fruits from your kitchen, or even sitting near a window where you can look outside on a tree or the sky. After Sylvie's presentation, we'll have time for some questions. And then at the very end, Sylvie will leave us with a final invitation for another exercise to try on our own. And on that note, I'd also like to mention that normally we try to keep our webinars pretty close to an hour. Uh, obviously, the nature of this webinar today is a little different than usual. Uh, so for that reason, we'd like to, we felt like it was important not to impose a strict timeline or deadline. Uh, so it's possible that we may go over a little bit past the hour today. Uh, we know that some of you may have other commitments. So if you do need to drop off at any point, we certainly understand. But if you have some flexibility in your schedule, uh, we hope that you can stay with us for the full experience if things do run over uh, by a few minutes. So now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Sylvie Rokab is an Emmy-nominated, award-winning filmmaker. Her most recent film, Love Thy Nature, narrated by Liam Neeson, earned 27 film awards, launched over 300 screenings, and formed partnerships with hundreds of organizations, helping to blossom the nature connection and nature as medicine movements. Sylvie is also a TEDx speaker and a workshop leader whose mission is to inspire a deeper connection with nature. She's a warm and engaging nature therapy guide who is passionate about leading others in wilderness experiences and strengthening their relationship with themselves, others, and our spellbinding natural world. If you'd like to join Sylvie, uh, one of her upcoming workshops is a trip to Belize with Holbrook in late October and early November of 2021. Uh, so we'll have some more information about that. Uh, Sylvia is fluent in four languages, and she was born in Rio de Janeiro. She currently lives in California, where she's joining us from today. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Sylvie. Sylvie, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And uh, the last point of what you just said explains to those of you who don't know me yet, why you hear this funny accent. It's a hybrid. So I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And I'm really excited to be partnering with Holbrook doing this. Um, what I love about Holbrook is that they are very conscious in terms of an environmental mission to really offset carbon. And also they help to empower local communities wherever we travel. And so it's just delightful to be partnering with you guys at Holbrook. And I'm really also very excited to be doing the Belize trip. And so today we're going to be talking about forest bathing. And I think Lindsay already gave you a good introduction in terms of like whether you're indoors or whether you're outdoors. The one thing I'm going to ask you to do is, Lindsay, you could send the poll and she's going to send the poll to you all. And you can basically let us know whether you're indoors or outdoors. It'd be, it'd be great to have a sense of like how many, what's percentage maybe? How many of you are indoors and how many are out? So uh, yeah, and then we can get started. And I'm going to share my screen with you all. And I'm sure I'll give you a couple of seconds, just fill out the poll. It looks like we have about 73% people indoors and about 27% outdoors. Sounds okay. So um, yeah, that's great to know. Thanks for answering that, folks. Um, so here we go. I think that 
The first thing I want to acknowledge is the fact that we're going through a really difficult time right now. And whatever layer of experience is the most difficult for you with this pandemic, you know, spending so much time indoors and really having uh, your freedom being limited, one of the things that I want to encourage you to do, and I'm hoping that I'm going to convey in this webinar, is the sense that we can experience forest bathing, also called nature therapy, basically from wherever we are, even if we are within four walls. And so, so one of the things that um, you know, we we're going to be talking about is how do we experience nature in human built environments? I mean, let's face it, most of our human built environments nowadays don't look anything like nature. But the truth of it is, is that, first of all, it's a matter of perception because ultimately everything comes from nature. And it's also a matter of including in our daily lives practices and habits that can really transform our relationship, not only to the natural world, but even to ourselves, because we're wired to connect with nature, right? So having that realization of connection by itself is something that is incredibly calming. So I'm gonna make this full screen here so you can see the whole thing. And here, I'll, so the introduction of for, what forest bathing is, and it really basically started in Japan. And the word, the word, the expression that's being used and that has been used in Japan since the 1980s is shindin yoku. And what this really means, if you were to translate it literally, shindin yoku means immersing yourself or bathing in the atmosphere of the forest. And what happened is, is that in the 1980s, Japan was going through the tech boom. And a lot, of their, a lot of people in their workforce were experiencing deep kinds of burnout. And this was manifesting itself by basically people's health were in terrible shape. The rates of cancer, cardi cardiovascular diseases, autoimmune diseases, not to mention anxiety and depression was skyrocketing. And the government in Japan decided that they wanted to invest serious resources in having different groups of scientists discover what would happen if people would go forest bathing as an antidote to basically their stress levels, but most importantly, also to reversing or improving some of their health conditions. And sure enough, their suspicion was right in that spending time in nature is incredibly healing to the physical body as well as to the brain. And so some of the studies that they discovered, they basically proved that, you know, your blood pressure uh, gets regulated by spending time outdoors. Your cardiovascular function is more effective. Um, your attention is actually improved outdoors. There's something called the subjunior prefrontal cortex in our brains that gets deactivated. This is the part of our brains that get into a place of rumination. And the rumination is a precursor for depression. Well, that part of the brain actually, when it's in the forest, it gets totally dormant. So you can think of nature as being a total antidepressant. And I know that it's like a no brainer for many people already, for you probably, but I think that the world needed to discover scientifically that nature really has this healing effect. And that one of the most interesting things is that um, trees have a way to maintain themselves healthy. And the way that the trees do it is by releasing volatile compounds that are called phytoncides. And these phytoncides, which in the West we call them essential oils, what these phytoncides do is that they actually stimulate the, the, um, the NK cells. They, they're called the natural killer cells. Those are the cells that eliminate virally infected cells. And those um, uh, cells also, these, these compounds, basically the phytoncides, 
and ultimately the natural killer cells, what they also do is that they have an effect in reducing rates of cancer. So it's pretty significant stuff. And um, with that, that was the beginning of forest bathing in Japan in the 1980s. It became completely mainstream. Millions of people in Japan have been doing this practice, <clears throat> excuse me, not only since the 80s, but actually for several centuries. In the 80s, the government created an organization and, and basically um, an institution that is designated for Shinrin Yoku. And Amos Clifford brought this practice to the West. And his mission eight years ago was to train as many guides as myself as possible. And because the whole idea is to try to bring this practice all over the world. And we believe that what yoga and meditation were 50 years ago is what forest bathing is today. It's just starting to blossom. People are just starting to get interested in it and to realize what this is. But there's no doubt in our minds that this is going to be mainstream. Because the truth of it is, is that it used to be mainstream. For 99.9% .9 of our time on earth, we've been doing this practice. We just forgot. And I think what ANFT, Amos Clifford's organization, which is called the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy, basically their mission and my mission, we have a joint mission to really inspire as many people as possible, including you, to really bring this practice into your life. So with that, what is the practice, you wonder? So what we do as guides is that we offer you invitations. And, uh, you know, a typical walk, this is really kind of like a mini version of the walk, as Lindsay mentioned, because we're only together for an hour. And I think that it's really important that you understand the practice logically as much as experientially. So the practice itself is very experiential. And we usually spend, you know, a minimum of two and a half to three hours on a walk to really deepen this practice. And ideally, you know, we spend workshops that are either three day long, day long, days long, or an expedition that might be like a seven day long, like the Belize expedition, for example. But basically what we're doing today will be both the experience and the understanding so that you leave today knowing what this is. And most importantly, what I'm really inspired to do is to make sure that you take with you those ideas. How can I do this on a daily basis? And start noticing things every day, right? From the days to come and the weeks and the months to come that there's a new discovery, you know, within your own environment. The practice slows you way down. And these invitations basically are meant to drop you from your head to your body so that you're having a very here and now type of experience. The other thing we do, whether it's in the wild or I want to encourage you to do, especially for those of you who are, who are outdoors, we call them awarenesses, which is basically, you know, if you're outdoors, if you're choosing a place to sit when I've given you an invitation, just don't choose a pile of ants, you know. Don't, you know, make sure that you know your environment. If I'm giving you an invitation to touch a leaf or to find a being, we call beings anything in nature, we call them beings. So if I tell you touch a being, don't touch something that might be poison oak or so just because I'm not there with you, unfortunately, we're not in the same location here and now, I'm counting on you to be mindful about what is the location that you're in and what are the things that you need to be aware about so that you're safe and you're interacting with nature in a way that is beneficial to you. So with that, I'm gonna give you the first invitation. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is, if you're comfortable standing, I'm going to encourage you to stand and find a location that feels really pleasant. 
don't worry too much about it. Just stand in a location that feels like, okay, this feels right for me. And those of you who are sitting, I would encourage you to just sit upright so that your spine is nice and straight and you're opening the channels for deep breathing. And if it feels comfortable for you, just close your eyes or maybe keep them just mildly open, just a little bit out of focus. And let's start with some really nice deep breaths. <sighs> Realize that your inhale is kind of like an out breath of other beings, whether they're trees or plankton. Keep breathing deeply until you feel your muscles starting to relax. You might notice certain muscles in your body that might be tight. Send your breath there and breathe it out. And allow your body to move so very gently in a way that's comfortable. You might want to stretch a little bit. You might bend your knees or move around in a gentle little dance. Just allow your body to arrive here and now. And as you breathe, what fragrances do you notice? They might be indoor fragrances and that's fine too. Or you might not notice any fragrance and that's also fine. Just be curious. Now I want to invite you to get in touch with whatever sounds are really far away from you. What do you hear? They might be human sounds or machine sounds, and that's okay too. Humans are also part of nature. And now notice what sounds might be the closest to you. You might even want to make some sound with your hands, rubbing one hand against another, bring them close to your ear. What does that sound like? As you rub your hands together, Allow your attention to shift focus from the sound gently to the touch. What does the touch of your skin feel like? You might now start connecting very gently to the sense of taste. The 
these thousands of little taste buds in your mouth that are alive. Bring your attention to them. If you're indoors and you brought some food next to you, you might allow yourself to have a little piece of fruit or bite on an herb or even have a little drink of water. Allow your senses to really come alive. At some point, you might even allow them to come alive simultaneously, like the symphony of senses that your body gives you every day. We have more than five senses. We have a gut sense we call intuition. We have the sense of gravity. What does that feel like as you shift your body from one foot to another? Or if you're sitting, you shift the pressure on your chair. Just sense the gravity. You might have something, we all have something called proprio sense, which is the sense that we can move parts of our body. We know that we're moving a hand or fingers. We don't need to look at them to know that we're moving them. It's just another sense. And you have an amazing sense that I want to invite you now and always to connect with the sense of imagination. Imagination is that playful side of you that allows for welcoming any possibility where you're tapping into the field of infinite possibilities. It's playful, it's fun, it's imaginative, it's creative. So you might play with reality where there are no limits. We don't need to be imprisoned by what we think is right or wrong. We can just let our imagination fly just for fun. So don't do it yet, but soon I'm gonna ask you to gently open your eyes. If you are near a window, for those of you who are indoors, make sure that you're facing that window. For those of you who are outdoors, allow your body to just shift in different directions. Let it turn in its own axis and see like if you were a magnet being pulled in a specific direction. Don't be attached to it. Just gently notice, oh, this position feels okay. I like it here. And just stay there in that direction. And now, so very gently, just peel your eyelids very slowly and imagine that it's the very first time in your whole life that you've had vision.
if you're indoors, what you see, allow your imagination to take you back in time and imagine that everything you see in your environment indoors really comes from nature. So what, what, what did your room look like? If, if all these things are from its original forest or beach or desert or ocean. And for you outdoors, imagine that what you're looking at might be conscious of your presence too. like there's sentience everywhere. So gently but slowly, just bring yourself back. And I would like for you to just write in the Q&A for those of you who are close to your computer, anything that you're noticing. So Lindsay, if you would like to maybe read out loud for us any comments that people might have written. Sure. So we have a lot of comments uh, from different people saying they're feeling more calm, feeling more peaceful, uh, more relaxed and open. Uh, we have some people who are noticing a change of temperature. Uh, we have one person who commented that she's indoors and that she loves uh, thinking of all the materials in the house coming from nature, the stone, the wood, etc. Uh, another person, a wooden writing desk made from the trees I see through my window, the same rich colors of wood. Nice, very nice. So I'm going to bring your attention back to the webinar. I know this is hard. It's hard for me too. It's like we're just getting started. And at the same time, I feel that there's some really great things I want to share with you that you can do on your own on days to come. So hopefully you can all see the slide of being indoors. And you see me there at the beginning of the pandemic when things started getting a little crazy, chopping some red chard, some delicious foods. And um, on the right, I was sharing here one of the tea ceremonies. So in forest bathing, we end our walks or our weekends or expeditions, depending you know, the format of our experiences, we always end them with a tea ceremony as something that we share as a community together. And at the same time, there's a lot of storytelling and we basically allow ourselves to experience foods together, which is a beautiful thing. So the part about being indoors is I want to encourage you for days to come, you know how in our busy lives, even during COVID, I know we all do it, right? The sense of multitasking. And I probably don't need to tell you that scientific research has proven that there is, there is no such thing as multitasking. Um, Stanford did a, a really fascinating study that shows that when we do several things at once, we don't do them 
any of them well. We lose attention, we lose focus, our anxiety skyrockets, and our tasks are very poorly performed. So what I want to encourage you is when you have a meal, really be present with your meal. Experience the food, the taste, the texture, the smells of that food, connecting with these beings that are on your plate and they came from nature, right? I mean, for me, there's a huge sense of gratitude when it comes to food um, and sharing it with people. So it's gratitude for the food and the people. There's also, so here we have a picture of a juicy orange. I find oranges to be magnificent. I mean, every fruit is magnificent in its own way, right? Some of them juicier than others. Um, when it comes to water, I want to actually turn you on to a wonderful book um, that's called Blue Mind by Wallace J. Nichols. And in the book, he talks about what is obvious to us, which is how we are attracted to water, right? We want to have ocean views, ideally, when we're in a specific location. We love swimming in water. We love bathing in water. We love drinking water. There's something magical about water. So even as you shower every day, I mean, one thing I love to do is to open a window. You know, ideally, if I'm in a location, I can look out the window and there's a piece of sky. If not, I use my sense of imagination, close my eyes and have the water at the end of the shower be really nice and cold, just cold enough to feel like I'm under a waterfall and just imagine you're like in this gorgeous place in the midst of the mountain and the mountain is offering its waters to you. Just having that visual sense or that experience of the water on your body can be incredibly healing and really bring you back to the present moment. Search for views. This was when I was staying with my friends Holly and Ravi at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I was in an office that had this view and every day I would look out and feel like, okay, when I need to take a break from staring at my screen at least once an hour, ideally, I would look out the window and sit on my chair, lean back and just kind of stare at the sky or stare at the, at the tree and the leaves and the wind and just let that sort of like wash my worry and my mind free of intensity, right? Because when we're too much in our brains as we normally are on a daily basis, it really takes us off balance. And there's a number of different conditions that comes out of stress, right? And cortisol that runs too high in our bloods. So having those breaks every day are incredibly important. And being outdoors, you know, touching anything that feels safe for one thing nowadays, especially if you're in the city. I mean, if you're in the wilderness, anything that's safe, when I mean safe in the city, meaning COVID is the concern, right? But when it comes to wilderness, I mean, it's as long as you have the awarenesses, right? Touch the tree trunk in the location that doesn't disrupt a beautiful line of ants that are going about their journey of finding food or going to their home or bringing leaves on their backs to make sure to create that special environment. So as long as you have your awarenesses, touch nature, smell it, taste it, and really be present. On the right, this picture you see on the right is um, when we were doing a forest bathing invitation, um, I was inviting folks at Esalen to basically gather nature art. And, you know, it's funny because a lot of people have an issue. They feel like, well, I'm not an artist. And I often tell folks, it's like, we have artistry in our veins. We are born artists. And nature reminds us that artistry is really everywhere. And so people sometimes feel awkward. What is art, whatever? Together we create art by bringing elements of nature. And with nature, you say, well, nature, you messed up. This tree trunk doesn't look nice. You know, it's like, 
nature is so forgiving, right? Everything in nature is beautiful and acceptable. And so looking at it from that standpoint, we might even shift our idea of what's art and what isn't. Um, one of the things I want to encourage you to do, if you're like in the city, I mean, of course, if you can't leave your home, hopefully in this day and age, there's a possibility that you can peek outside your window, but folks who can walk freely on the streets, what's on your street? Less, this street looks like a, a pretty street with like trees, but when you look to the right, there's like these poppy flowers and then as I was going about my day, I was just walking on the street and I found those poppy flowers. I'm like, oh, cool, they're blossoming. And I'm like, I'm wondering what they look like when I'm like really close to them. And then sure enough, I found this bumblebee just delighting itself with the flower. And I'm sure the flower delights itself too, right? It's a give and take of this beautiful exchange. Um, you know, you could think of it as, as a love affair in a sense. It's like they are just mesmerized with each other. What else is on your street, right? We don't often take the time to look at trees and the beauty of the sky as the background. And if we allow our imaginations, an invitation I love to give people is have a conversation with a being. And oftentimes the being that I choose, uh, thanks to my mother, Sonia, who actually is on the call, hi mom. She taught me the beauty of connecting with trees and they are such magnificent beings. And you know, for those who are skeptics about the intelligence of trees, there's new research that's coming out just in the last few years that talks about how trees are so incredibly sentient and they are aware of so much, um, you know, how they exchange information. And they say that the brains of the trees are actually at their roots. The roots connect with fungi and bacteria and they create this, we call it the wide wood web or the wood wide web where there's this network of connectivity of the roots and the fungi and the bacteria and trees throughout an entire forest can actually communicate information, survival information, and actually help trees that are sick revive. It's really fascinating if you're interested in this a science. It's just incredible what science is proving what wisdom and indigenous traditions have known for millennia. They're kind of finally coming together. There, there's a holism happening between science and the spiritual traditions that's very exciting to see. So what's on the street? You can get as close, as intimate, as comfortable. I know sometimes I might be connecting with a tree and at the peak of my eye wondering like maybe those people across the street think that I'm weird and so what, right? Practicing being with the feelings that emerge from being present with a being that sadly is radical in our society. But I'll tell you what, I am sure of it. Just give it a few years it'll be just as mainstream as breathing because it is. So we'll give it time. We're not going to be weirdos anymore. <laughs> it's fascinating how things are changing fast. Allow yourself to play with the fractal patterns in nature. They are everywhere. Look at this beauty here of different patterns and textures that you can play with. Here's a little picture of a tea ceremony because as we approach the end of our session, we want to give you all like 15 minutes of Q&A and make sure that, you know, as you can tell, I can talk about this for days, right? It's really hard to do this within a short period of time, but also delightful to be able to be doing it with you. I just want to offer you virtually a cup of tea and say, I honor your presence. And I am so very grateful that you are here today. I am so very grateful to nature for supporting us and for nurturing us. 
inspiring us every day, every second of every day, really, even if we know it or not. Nature is working in the background. <laughs> I bet you, you don't know what's happening inside your veins or inside your digestive system, or even conscious that we're breathing. Oftentimes I forget, right? There's this inner nature that's hard at work and I don't even know it. So here we go. I'm gonna read three of my favorite quotes. Everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. This is from John Muir. Let's see, I have a little thing here that's sort of like on the way of the quote. I will let you read it and I'll be in silence. That's a quote from my mentor, Amos Clifford, who created ANFT, the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy. Nature connection and culture repair arise together. And that is so true. Today, we're focusing on your well being. The truth of it is, is that if all of humanity were to do nature connection, there's no mistaking our civilization would be much, much more evolved. And I feel that the times that we're experiencing right now, so I have this little bunny here for you, don't waste the crisis. It might just be that this crisis could be the biggest, the hugest. I know it doesn't exist. <laughs> I am forgiven, I'm, English is not my first language, so I can say weird things like the hugest, the hugest opportunity to really connect with a bigger picture, right? It's almost like I saw something on Facebook the other day that was like, nature sent us to our rooms during COVID, right? Because it's like we were going so fast everything was happening so intensely, not to mention the enormous amounts of pollution and, uh, you know, intensity of, um, you know, sickness of other kinds that have to do with environmental destruction as well as unhealthiness of environmental justice. And of course, we're in the midst in the United States, but I think all around the world, also a sense of there's a crisis in the way that we treat each other just because of the color of our skin or that there are lifestyle choices. Nature has so much to teach us in terms of the power of diversity, the power of acceptance of other, the power of understanding that underneath everything, we're completely united. So I want the, my, my biggest invitation of today, of this short time that you and I are having together is don't let this crisis go to waste. Use it so that you really come to realize or deepen your realization, because I know many of you already have this realization, but deepen the realization of how critical nature is in your life. And I have a little daily practice here for those of you who would like, you can take a screen grab. Um, you know, I promised you I was going to give you 15 minutes of Q&A, so we won't have the time. There's a clip at the end of Love Thy Nature. We call it the call to action. And, you know, I also call the invitation clip. The invitation clip is basically a very sort of like, of course, I'm biased, but it's, I'm going to say it. It's a beautiful immersion, a cinematic immersion into what you can do on a daily basis and on an yearly basis to uh, really connect and deepen your connection with nature. 
So I want to encourage you to watch that clip. It's only two minutes long. Uh, what I can do is I can actually just copy and paste the clip here and you can watch it on your own. So let me just do that real quick. It's actually on Vimeo and everybody can see it. So it's not a problem here. Back to Zoom. Let's see. I think I need to stop sharing the screen for a second here so that I can put it on the Q&A. Lindsay, should I put it on the Q&A or on the chat? I think on the chat, right? Let me see here. I'm going to Yeah, put if you want to put it on the chat, chat that should work. I think that's probably the best thing to do. Here we go. So I put it on the chat and you can watch it after we're done here together. Or maybe, you know, since we talked about extending the webinar by a few minutes, you know, we can also watch it together after folks who have a strict timeline need to go. So that would be fine too. So I want to go back here on Zoom and share screen again. Here we go. Keynote. Share. Did it? Oops. Sylvie, I apologize. I accidentally muted you. I think you need to um, unmute yourself. <laughs> Ironically, I was just <laughs> explaining that Keynote is a wonderful app because it's so visual, as you can tell but it's got a challenge in that it's not it's really really difficult to toggle back and forth with zoom but we're we're getting there so the invitations clip i think everybody heard the part about the clip being a link that i shared on vimeo uh, for those of you who might not have seen it we can always follow up with an email and send you the the link to the clip then so it's not a problem and yeah i mean my Basically, I think I've said it in many, many ways. I really wish you nature. We can go for Q&A. We have uh, one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is to join us for uh, the real experience. Um, again, we're doing this Belize trip that I'm really excited about. You have a whole year to plan for, like prepare for it, I should say. Um, it's November 2021, and uh, we're really, really, I'm very excited to be doing this. We did uh, something very similar in Costa Rica with Manuela Siegfried. Hi, Manuela. I'm sure you must be on the call or probably listening to this later. I don't know. But in any case, uh, Manuela and I are partnering. Um, she's an amazing forest bathing guide and uh, really delighted, for, delighted to be doing this with Manuela and with Holbrook, so I hope you can join us. All right, so I'll pass it to Lindsay. Um, I think we can do Q&A now. So anybody who has questions, and if Lindsay, you wanna go through some of these questions and shoot them my way, that would be fabulous. Wonderful, well, thank you, yes. Um, yeah, we do have a few questions so far. Um, we have one person who's asking if you could please repeat the name of the water book that you mentioned. Um, I think it's it was about Blue 30 months. Blue Mind. Sorry, Blue Mind. And do Blue you know Mind. the author on that? <laughs> yes, yes. Wallace J. Nichols. Wallace, W-A-L-L-A-C-E, Nichols, N-I-C-H-O-L-S. Wallace Great, J. Nichols. thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Um, uh, Sylvie, greetings, green greetings from Nova Scotia. Uh, this is uh, from Carrie. Uh, grateful for this wonderful experience. <laughs> uh, would you say something, please, about nature as an antidote to tech overload? It's even more of a challenge these days. Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, I think when I was 
uh, mentioning my working on the computer and looking out the window, um, one of the things that I feel is really critical is what Richard Louvre mentions. And I know you know this, Carrie, because you wrote an amazing book about technology. And, um, you know, feel free to share this on your Q&A, by the way, you know, but um, I think Richard Lou's quote is the one that comes to mind right now, where he says, the more high tech we become, the more we need nature. And it's so true because we can really get lost in cyber world. And what happens is not only it disconnects us, when you're working with this machine, with this computer, as miraculous as this is, you know, we couldn't be communicating right now, so we have to acknowledge the beauty of technology, right? But also making sure that it's limited and making sure that we have, like, you know, in the Jewish tradition, we have Shabbat on Fridays. It's so important to have a tech break. And, um, you know, for many reasons. And so I don't know that I will have the time to go through all of the reasons, but I feel that there's the, the issue of anxiety and being on overdrive, basically having our nervous system perpetually connected is really a problem for our mental health. There's the issue of like our bodies sitting in this position is okay for an hour. But certainly after an hour, I don't know about you, but our bodies need to move. Our bodies were designed to move. There's also some scientific evidence that our eyes, like children's eyes nowadays are being affected. A lot more children today need to wear glasses than they ever did in the past. Why? Because they're forcing their eyes to be imprisoned by this range, right? Or this range to the technology instead of you know, there's a, there's a poet that wrote a quote about something about our eyes yearn for the horizon. i sorry, I don't remember who said it, but somebody said something like that. And it's so true. Those of you who love watching sunsets or, I mean, I love watching the horizon, any horizon, but it's like, there's a yearning. Our eyes yearn for the horizon. And I feel our soul, our spirit yearns for horizons and for infinity, right? Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind. Wow, thank you. I hope that works, uh, Carrie. And yeah, like I said, um, you know, Carrie is releasing a, a book on technology, and I think that it would be lovely if you were to share with us. I don't know if it's already out, but I know whenever it's out, it would be great. I'll certainly mention it on our newsletter because it's something that I think should be shared with everybody. But it's really, really great work. Thanks for joining, Carrie. Great, thank you. And I'll just mention um, details on this new book uh, with lots of Sylvie's input are available at lessscreenmoregreen.org if anyone's interested in, in reading more on that. Um, Thanks for sharing. Let's see. We also have a question uh, from someone who uh, first said that they're uh, so grateful for this experience and would like to dive deeper into the work. Can you recommend any uh, resources or starting points for someone who's interested in becoming a certified nature therapy guide? Sure, I mean, the most uh, important, I think, resource that's available, I mean, there are many, certainly. Um, let me just say that the beauty um, of this work is finally being seen by mainstream media. So uh, forest bathing has been covered by National Geographic, Time Magazine, the New York Times, and a plethora of other publications, international publications, of course. And um, for resources for people who want to get trained like yourself, go to the ANFT website, which is the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy. They also say guides and programs. And their mission is to train guides. So yeah, the more of us in this field, the merrier. I usually say to my colleagues, it's like, you know, we need to join forces like trees join their roots on their ground. It's like we need this movement to grow so vast and wide. And you know what? Many of you know, all of you know by now, I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> That's my work by trade in the last 25 years. And I'm doing this work now because I'm feeling like 
this is so critical. If you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a teacher, if you're a politician, it doesn't matter. You can join the movement. It's a six months practicum. And what it does is that it deepens our awareness in a way that, of course, you know, forest bathing over three days or an expedition deepens, you know, our experience in a beautiful, magnificent way. But imagine doing this for six months. It's just extraordinary. So I very much encourage, thank you um, for asking that question. And I want to encourage as many people as possible to bring these teachings into your life first for yourself, because we can only help other people if we can help ourselves first, right? And help humanity and help the planet ultimately, because I feel that this is the work of, you know, um, let me just share one more quote from Rumi. I have to share this one. It is my top favorite quote and it's my in my signature as well. It's let the beauty of what you love be what you do. There are a thousand ways to kneel. This is from Rumi. And I like to add with Rumi's permission, let yourself be kissed by the earth. So yeah, that's a long answer to a short question, but I hope, I hope it was beneficial to all of you. So I just wanna do a time check. We are at 158. Um, I don't know that I can answer another question in one minute. That's a little too short. <laughs> so, so those of you who are on the schedule, I understand deadlines, believe me, I do. Um, you know, don't feel shy to just log off. And um, I'm really, really, really grateful that you attended. I really, really hope that you bring this work into your daily life. Put some post-it notes if you need to on your kitchen. Delight yourself with food today, something like that. Or, you know, in your bathroom shower, like enjoy the water. Or like when you go outside, it's like feel the earth, go barefoot, you know. Earthing is a real thing. It's been proven scientifically that if we step on grass or on sand or on dirt, electrons flood our bodies. It's a way to boost our immune system. So do whatever you want, need to do. And, but those of you who need to log off, thank you for attending. And we'll just take a couple of other questions if that's okay. Sure, yeah. So um, I have uh, one question here. When you lead forest bathing exercises, what kinds of surprising things have happened? Oh, wow. That's a really, really great question. Oh. I mean, the, the first one that comes to mind, I'm having a hunch and intuition, one of our senses, right? That's telling me that it, it's, it's okay to share this. Um, there's a, a, a lady that came to our Esalen um, workshop and she said that she had lost her mother recently and that there was a particular number that was associated with her mother. I don't know if it was the year her mother was born or something like that. That was a significant number for her mother. And when she, I gave them the invitation to go connect with a being on, in the forest, um, in the sharing, she said that she was called by this one tree like, you know, I tell people, sense which being wants to connect with you. You know, it's like, let your, again, let your imagination run wild. And imagine, like if you were a Pixar movie director, imagine that all these beings are sentient and one of them is calling to you. She sat with this one tree and after having a deep conversation with that tree in her mind, um, she, I'm saying in her mind, not that it's not real, but she wasn't saying it out loud is what I'm trying to say. She realized that that tree had a number, you know, some trees because of the crazy times we're living in and the decimation of species and some trees that are dying and scientists are numbering trees to follow their progress and all of that. The number on the tree was the number that was significant to her mother in the midst of her working out her grief 
about her mother's death with that tree. It was very moving and I remember it touched me very deeply and it touched many people around very deeply because it was, wow, you know, it's like, we don't know what, you know, <laughs> what the quantum field, the unifying field, the universe, some people call it God or whatever it is for you, nature, I call it nature, whatever nature presents itself, we don't know, but sometimes there's some magical synchronicities that are really, really memorable. I have a few others to share. Should I share one more that was really, really cool? Sure, yeah. I'll, I'll do uh, this 13 year old kid who uh, had um, attended the screening. This was in Greece and it was a Thessaloniki film festival. We did a screening for, I think it was, there were like probably three to 400 kids. Um, all of them, like imagine like a bunch of like middle schoolers in one room. It was like, the, the level of intensity was like incredible. It was very in, super pleasurable because obviously this work, being able to influence kids at that age is really, really amazing. So this 13 year old, really shy boy and he was wearing like a light pink shirt and you know, you could tell he was a very acute but very shy and introverted kid and and he was like his question was like why did you make this movie and um you know he all of all of the peers around him were teasing him and like kind of like making fun of the fact that he was being shy and i took the opportunity to try to give this kid a little bit of a little self-esteem boost and and he looked like a, a bright kid and i i saw i said to him I can see in these bright eyes that you have the exact answer to that question. And of course, all of the other kids were like, Rawr, making all kinds of noises and like sort of like cheering him on and teasing him at the same time. I don't exactly know what all of that noise was about. And the kid was hesitant and all of that. And finally he blurted out of his mouth something like, is it because you want to teach us about the magic of nature? I said, exactly. And the whole crowd just bursted into cheers. This time it was like thumbs up. So that was a very memorable experience. It was related to the film, but it was also related obviously to this theme because the film is about this theme and forest bathing is, you know, is married to the film without me even knowing when I was creating the film. So it's, it's all connected, right? Wow. So that's another story. So unless we have another burning question, do we have a question, Lindsay, that you feel is something that we should really attend to? Or should we go for the movie clip? Since I'm talking about Love Thy Nature so much, we could mm -hmm. all experience the movie clip together. And, you know, I mean, I, I'll be happy to say a goodbye after the clip or, I think, you know, intuitively, I feel that we've already parted ways energetically, like we are in the process of parting ways. It's like kind of like a birth, I think. <laughs> um, you know, think of it as why don't we watch the film together and I will watch it with you. And with the power of our energies together, we might just sort of like maybe send um, a wish or a thought or a desire that the burnout of COVID be completely dissolved, you know, in your life, hopefully in the lives of people around you, and that we wish that for everyone around the planet. Maybe we can do this in the form of wishing that everyone experiences this, you know, I call it this work, but it's really this practice, these teachings that nature has wired us to know this again we're just remembering we're just reminding ourselves that we are these nature beings that have been on the planet in natural environments for 99.9 percent .9 of our time on earth and so we just need to remember to occasionally make time for that connection in our minds and with our bodies, right? So I shared the clip. I'm gonna share the clip here again. Let me just make sure that everybody has it. Bear with me here while I navigate Keynote. 
Here we go. Keynote and Zoom. Hopefully, they will connect easily someday, too. Here's a clip again for those of you. It's in the chat. And so I will say goodbye. Thank you all so much for coming. Enjoy the two minute of Love Thy Nature. The whole movie is available in three platforms for free. Um, and so I know that Lindsay and the whole Brooke team is going to share that with you. Um, so, you know, you can watch the whole film. Right now we'll just watch the call to actions or I also call the invitations clip. So wishing you nature. Bye-bye folks. Thank you so much, Sylvie. It's uh, my pleasure. I can't talk that. So we'll just say thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we'll send out the recording to the webinar, uh, the sure. links that were mentioned. And uh, thank you again to everybody for joining us. Sure. All the best. Bye.